Let's start this. Okay, hello everyone. This is the Future of Photography. A bit of a different episode. This is a live stream. This is a video stream. This is an audio stream. We are doing this on our Discord, so it might sound a bit different and definitely look a bit different. We lost our bubbles, unfortunately. Um, which I, you know I love those bubbles um, and uh, <laughs> then we have a live audience in the discord in our community home um, which is at tfttf.com slash join to if you are watching this left bottom on your screen that's where you can find that and um, unfortunately Imar cannot make it today but we have Jeremiah and Adrian hello hello hi <laughs> it's the, very, it's the end of a long very, day of sitting in front of screens for me. Yeah, I yeah, it's the end of civilization here, but the beginning yeah. of a new day. <laughs> yeah, that is fine. As long as we wake up in the morning, everything is okay. I think I have. <sighs> yeah, let's let's check our pulses for a second. Yeah, it's it's still there. I actually did a uh, a little seminar today at the photo show. At, there you uh, did, you. I did I did that. Yeah, so, I did the copyright seminar. Awesome. Uh -huh. So we have we have about 45 minutes to go here today because then the stuff will happen. And um, so we're time limiting this one today. We want to discuss a bit what was going on at the photography show today. It's in Birmingham, right? Well, it's usually well, it in Birmingham. It would have been in yes. Birmingham <laughs> if it wasn't a virtual show today, which it gave... would also have been in March as well. But <laughs> yeah, but this gave Jeremiah and me the opportunity to go there, have a look at some of the sessions because they were streaming all the sessions virtually. Yeah, and um, um, yeah, it, it was it was cool. So let's just take turns um i know adrian you watched at least four or five of them probably more i got oh boy, yeah. i got to watch three unfortunately only jeremiah got watched one so why don't we start with you adrian and just give us like a five minute rundown on one of your favorite okay. sessions five, five minutes look can you not see these notes <laughs> <laughs> see white screen oh yeah I got, so, so I thought I'd I thought I'd take some notes because there's, I've seen so much stuff today, and I thought I might forget some of it. So it's um, uh, so it's been it's been really interesting. It's the first time I've ever done one of these things, yeah, you know, a virtual trade show or or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, some of it just made me just smile. Some of it was charming and made me smile and made me feel happy. Uh, and other bits of it were slightly glitchy. Um, and uh, overall, uh, I think it was a, a really good effort, actually. Um, I've enjoyed it. It's been it's not quite as hectic as it usually is, because usually I'm running around the show floor all day and you know, uh, stuff like that. But it's um, but it has been fun. So what have I seen today? Just in, in no particular order, actually, probably in chronological order, because that's the yeah, that's the way I wrote the notes. Um, I have seen uh, The Art of Seeing with Ben Brain shooting a BBC documentary series on an iPhone. That was probably my favourite, actually. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, changing the narrative of African society. Audio for video 101. Mobile and solutions journalism. I had no idea what solutions journalism is. I'm not, still not sure. <laughs> um, how to tell better stories with the production studio you already own, your smartphone. Being unique, seeing things that others don't. How to use 360 cameras to capture epic stories with no crew. Uh, big up your rig, taking your mobile kit to the net max. And how to capture our beautiful world. Now, as you can see, there's quite a lot of mobile That's stuff. That's a in bit there, of a tour um, de force which, you did there. Wow. It's That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. I was going for creative stuff, and I was also trying to find in the techie area um, some of the things that we might be interesting to the TFOP audience, um, which is why there's a bit of a bias towards mobile kit and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been it's been a really interesting one. See, seeing the guy who who shot a a TV documentary series for the BBC on an iPhone, not just on an iPhone, he had another camera as well. That was a GoPro four. <laughs> so <laughs> two cameras. There you go. Two That's cameras, yeah, yeah, and he lives he lives on a, a canal barge, you know, a, a narrow boat uh, that that uh, plies or did t historically ply trade between uh, various different cities in in the north and east, and and sometimes down to the south of England, um, and uh, that's what his his 
documentary series and his YouTube channel are about. He was hilarious um, and uh, re really good fun. Um, and that was a good example of the shows, actually, uh, the sessions, because some of them were interviews, you know, one to one interviews. So there was an interviewer back at base and then the, the, the guest or, or interviewee, uh, wherever they happen to be. Others were technical sessions that were pre-recorded and the uh, the people that had done the pre-recording were also live in the chat so you could chat with them live uh, as the pre-recorded video went out um, and so some of that was was quite effective i'm just trying to think of uh, you know just pull out a couple of headlines about sort of what i might have learned or, or seen um definitely uh there is um there's definitely a big push all around the world to using much lighter weight equipment for for day-to-day -day stuff uh, um i that they're not so much perhaps for feature films or for high budget stuff oh yes definitely chris you're waving your phone there there's a lot of that around um although possibly i did seek it out um and that, so and consequentially of course there's a lot of people who are trying to add little bits and bobs to make up for any deficiencies you might have in a cell phone as you go filmmaking um audio being the prime one plenty of stuff around audio uh, and some really good sessions today actually i did watch one that was uh, from a guy who worked for road microphones um, and who was just doing the very basic principles of eq compression stuff like that but in a video editing context um which i think i probably knew most of that uh but that was it was certainly a good refresher um uh it's worth actually noting at this point that all of the uh all of the videos that have been played unless they were live or interviews all of the videos that have been played uh, will be available for some while so even if you can't make it you can go to the photography show website register and then log in and watch some of this stuff for the next few weeks um so so that's uh, another another thing worth doing and they're so on tomorrow according to the Man. This is the 20th of September mm -hmm. 2020 right now. So if uh, if anyone's watching this live on the stream, then yeah, tomorrow there's more sessions. So we've only kind of covered the first day. Um, they, and and we have to say, they, they weren't really that in-depth. I mean, there are very short sessions. Most of them that I saw were around the 30-minute mark. So... Mm -hmm. um, which I think is more like for, for me felt more like like a tasting buffet. You know, you can like sample different areas and then find out what's interesting to you, and then probably go back for more um, in other contexts. But uh, it worked really well for me that format. Yeah, I I liked it because it was I was able to cover a lot of ground. You know, so you can go from one thing. You know, you can go yeah. for uh, the art of seeing. You know, who and and a lot of these presenters had you know three to five bullet points of things that you could really take away and be tangible. Mm -hmm you know to help you with your photography uh and then uh then you could nip from that to a technical one then back to a creative one and and things as a sort of, sort of social documentary type things um and i really like that actually i found it was great and especially seeing is you know you know what it's like when you're at these places for real the two things you want to see uh are several hundred meters apart <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and if you if you pick the wrong one and you get there in five minutes and you think oh no i should have gone to the other one um then you have to try and struggle through crowds to get out of one theater make your way across the floor to another and theater. you will catch all kinds of things on these trade shows <laughs> <laughs> well, I, i'll tell you what i, I miss um i miss packing a knapsack with all of the handouts you get like so you go home with like yeah. a ton of paperwork and of course the junk food which is generally the only thing yeah. to eat at these places <laughs> uh and uh, long bathroom lines so those are the things that i felt uh were missing but everything else seemed <laughs> quite good uh, my, uh you know good no, it's just yes. Um, uh, um, the as as these places are, they're always notorious for having terrible food, aren't they? Uh, and if it is edible, then it's three times the price it should be on the street. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I didn't miss that. Um, I did miss though. I did miss meeting friends uh, face to face and and chatting, seeing people I haven't seen for six months or even a year sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I do miss. I did miss. Um, there's sort of, there seem to be a bit more friction in the interactions. Um, so, you know, if you're wandering a trade show floor 
and you can you wander onto a stand and you're playing with a camera somebody will come up and say hello and you'll have a quick conversation you know um there there were people available for online chat and i think even audio as well audio chats uh, on the various different vendors stands um but i didn't go for that at all um there seemed to be a bit more friction there and also probably I, I wasn't really in a buying mood today anyway so it wasn't my intent to buy anything today so. it's also also a lot of the interaction that you had between your peers is not there um they they didn't set up like a, a meeting area a virtual meeting area for us the the consumers to um mm. to meet and hang Good out point. which 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 you have a lot on these trade shows and um i've i've been on another event where they did that but that was not a free event so it was a different kind of dynamic there of course so and a different need for the think, yeah. uh for the for the um for the company who ran that event to to supply that so yeah i i think that that it could be improved by the addition of private rooms uh which individual artists or um creators in general could uh assign a kind of time where they will be there to interact with people on a mm. much more um general way um just to meet and greet uh yeah. I, i've been in situations like that and it, it's worked very very well also where you you could in advance say all of these uh lectures um or or photographers or videographers are going to be there why don't you put in those who you would like to meet and that is sent out and so that kind of creates a early dynamic so that when you meet them there is that kind of uh bonhomie as as uh, we french call it you know I, i my own experience was uh quite different i went um a because i was just waking up Uh, but uh, uh, did uh, see a very interesting uh, lecture on copyright, uh, a subject that is uh, near and dear to my heart and very, very um, important to me and my work. Uh, and and uh, I, I, had, I had communicated with this particular lawyer in the past on certain, um, uh, on certain copyright questions. And he gave a very, very thorough analysis and had opened it up to a lot of interaction. There was not a huge amount of people there. So there's a lot of interactive discussion, uh, back and forth, question and answer that, that I thought was, uh, was quite good. Of course, at the end of the day, uh, what I took away was the fact that uh, copyright law on, you know, both in Europe, uh, the UK, Uh, no longer part of Europe <laughs> and, and America are, are extraordinarily uh, complex, all gray zone, all very much up to individual judges. And in, many, in many cases, very broken. Yes. <laughs> a complete, like, so I came, I came away feeling not quite despondent, but like that every uh, approach to copyright whether you are on the um on the kind of misuse side uh, so called or on the protective side of your own work is extraordinarily gray complex and there is no uh road to follow to either protect yourself or reappropriate work um and that you know that i think is is in terms of our future photography, something that will either uh, harden in terms of the definition of who owns what, when, how licenses are disseminated, what is the fair um, price for someone who does misuse copyright. All of those things will either harden and be uh, like any kind of evolving legal um, evolution. Um, or it will just be more and more chaotic. Um, I've, because I'm on the political action committee of the directors guild, we meet often on, on protecting coffee, copyright with, uh, senior officials, senators, uh, Congress women, et cetera, and people of the executive. And, and the, the problem we have, and I've, I've been part of, you know, testifying also in Washington. Um, one of the problems with it is, 
that the lawmakers on on everywhere in the world are not that familiar with what it really means uh, to create work, to uh, redress work, to reinvigorate old work. Uh, so they don't have the kind of deep understanding that artists or even publishers um, have, uh, and and that creates uh, a lot of problems for their staff. And so legislation is very difficult to move through uh, whatever our collective systems are. What so, is the name of the speaker? Um, I will tell you. I'll tell you in a I, moment. I think, I think might, some, some people might want to go and yeah, sure. watch some of those exactly. sessions. The, the thing is, the, the, the stuff is available online for free. So it um, is. it's not it a paid is, event, uh, so everyone can join in there and it's uh, yeah, also gonna... categorized isn't it so on on the if when you log into the show the the yeah. the content is in streams and the, one of the streams certainly was about the business of stuff yeah uh, so so i would yeah it, it was in there richard Leibowitz, i think okay. uh, Leibowitz uh, yeah, law okay. firm uh we could you know we could put this up on a show note too of yes. uh he's he Leibowitz law firm uh, specifically is engaged in uh i think photo copyright uh, on both sides of the equation okay um, and he seems to know a lot about it so look you know look for that okay so I've watched uh, several sessions and I've looked some some more on the creative side of things uh, including one that was quite unassuming but um, it did something with me and it was the art of backlight by Andy Parkinson and yeah. um, what he did is but he basically showed photos uh, he's a wildlife photographer, so he showed a lot of wildlife photos that were all very heavy on the backlit side. And I'm a great fan of that type of lighting because it always adds interest mm, to things. Me too. Um, I, I kept saying on workshops that everyone should have a backlight with them all the time just to be look, to look good <laughs> on portraits, you know. Yeah, just have to have this attached somewhere behind your head uh, in a sort of a harness. Um and d very different kinds of backlit photos. He doesn't artificially light it. He says he, he artificially lit three photos in his career with big strobes and things. But uh, he just gets up really early in the morning and is up late so that it that you get the 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 situation where light is very low, very direct, and then you have a swan with like the feathers uh, around it being lit up and it's almost a silhouette and then it's splashing water. You have these water splashes in the air be be in front of a dark background, like really star striking photography. And uh, it's a future of the f photography thing for me because uh, we see cameras kind of doing, doing depth estimation and re rejiggering the lights a bit like changing the the way the light falls on something based on the depth estimate and it's it's looking okay but that's the kind of stuff that no ai at this point will be able to do uh, it, it, or if then nowhere near the fidelity of this um so it, it re it's really a good exercise watching that talk is really good exercise in in in, in in understanding a bit more what light actually does because that is just yeah. the, po stunning. the power of backlight uh, uh is um is so much uh more uh sculptural and yes. i want to say glowy it, it, it's a misuse of the word but um, when i began my my uh so-called career in in film i was a commercial director i did many, many, many commercials. And I worked with many, many, many DPs, uh, European in particular, br many Brits. And those Brits who I worked with, the British DPs, Adrian Biddle uh, as one shot for Ridley early, um, they were all in the 80s. The, they would not do a shot unless it was backlight. <laughs> and I remember going uh, and we were lighting scenes inside um, kind of big, small rooms, and they would punch these hard lights through opposite windows. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm like, not surprised because it, it has. And I, it, I embraced it. It you makes, know, it like, makes very, very strong compositions. Yeah, I think it's great. I'm, Even just as casual portraits, I think it's great. So one of the things absolutely. I've always loved to do is just use uh, yeah, a little bit of on-camera fill flash and have the sun in the background. 
You yeah. know, um, I had when I had the original Fuji X100, I used to do that quite a lot because that had just a little, um, had a little fill in flash built well, into the camera. Yeah. And you also had, uh, you could dial it down. You had a flash exposure compensation yeah. or flash compensation, whatever the right word is. And you could dial it down by about like a stop and a half. Um, yeah. And it would just put a little catch light in the jar, just a little bit, yeah, you know, a catch light in the eye, and it would, and just a little bit of fill to the face, and and it was, it was a splendid, a splendid thing. And Parkinson did I did both. I mean, he did did like really hard silhouettes with just a, a rim of light around yeah. them, and some where he he had a lot of light in the front, like a. I think it was a hair jumping over snow. So there was lots of light coming from below reflected from the snow. So really like all the different kinds of things really makes you think and really kind of drives home the point that ah, the machine learning things are not really ready for that yet. We have, we still have to see the yeah, light and I, watch I, the I, light. Yeah. I think you're a hundred percent on this, that there are things that even if AI could generate some kind of automatic exposures, it would not be as sensual or dynamic yeah. as the ratio of backlight to front light. It, yeah. It's that some images are just so incredibly powerful when you have a, you know, blasting backlight and just it's the reduction, to, you know, bring it, the sh it's the yeah. reduction and it makes the viewer work. It makes their brains work and put together the <laughs> puzzle pieces because they only get a very limited uh, amount of information from just a rim of something. Yeah. You know, so it seems that, to me that we should we should do an episode on <laughs> lighting and the future of lighting in terms of uh, all these new technologies which are available and what will work and what will forever be uh under the the best auspices of nature and and so creating that it's probably well worth the conversation making a note it does about sound this. like it'd be well worth the <laughs> conversation yeah it's, it's it is an interesting one that that yeah when it comes to those elements of the craft i mean if the 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 craft is the human craft and skill is still needed i uh uh, it, it's it's called to mind one of the other sessions I watched. I think Chris, you watched this as well, uh, which was uh, the um, how to be your own crew uh, using a three hundred and sixty camera. Yes, um, and uh, I I think you know as as <laughs> as funny as it was to watch, um, I think the the technology in that particular camera probably isn't quite up to it yet. I mean, it it was unfortunate that the video seemed to have been shot at the beach on a very bright and sunny day because it really did. Um, it really did show up some of the weaknesses in the sensor. It in showed the, the limitation in the in the dynamic range so well, um, and um, uh, it, I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing what you can do with these three sixty cameras. Um, it's all. It also moves a lot of the work that you do as a creative it normally what you do is you do a lot of work as a creative at the beginning of the process and during the process and what this does is it it moves all these creative decisions to the end of the process because you just hold up the camera and then it captures everything and then you will go back and do framing at the end of the process so the workload yeah. towards the end of the process gets so much higher by some of these things that i have i'm um, i think one thing that might happen is that people will uh, shoot a lot, but then they hate the editing because it's that, all that work that they're creating while shooting. And uh, yeah. so that, that's, I think that's a weak point of these kind of cameras, that they create a mountain of work at the end of the process. I, th I think they do. But if you are a one-person crew and you don't have any choice then at least there is an option i think i think we need a bit of maturity there talking about the future of photography um True. i think these things have become really interesting uh, when they become a bit cleverer and they have things like built-in ND filters because uh, you can't put an ND filter on a 360 cat. Where would you put it? Oh, <laughs> you'd like, do, you'd, like you'd a put a spherical ND filter. You'd put a membrane. A, 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 <laughs> yeah, an yeah. ND Christmas ornament around it. That's yeah, it. Membrane, to, yeah. I, I, um, my 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 beef with with 360 cameras are uh, more from the storytelling point of view which is uh unless you go into a situation with a point of view 
what you're really doing is just making a general capture and then inventing it later. Not that you can't apply great creative sensibility. I mean, Jim Cameron's movies are effectively shot like that, um, you know, in a much bigger scale. But the what what is orchestrated beautifully is the blocking of the dynamic movement between people and the relationships. They're there for the eye to see, and then the capture can be adjusted so that subject itself, like theater, is very, very much the the, the inception. I mean, in still photography, it's. I, I don't see it yet. We are, we are, we are. I think we are just in the process. When when we look back at how film has evolved, filming movies have evolved. In the beginning, there were big boxes. The cameras were big boxes that were stationary, and then they put them on rails and they could move. And then they put them on cranes, and then they put them on your shoulder, and you could be hand out. Every I will make a correction there. Making Sorry? a correction. The first cameras were light, small, and much easier to move. I'm talking about big <laughs> Hollywood productions kind of stuff. So uh, afterwards, like <laughs> yeah, but but what we're looking at is an evolution, and every time something new came along, the according language had to be invented, and the same thing is happening right now. We have these yes. captures that capture everything, and. Uh, we still don't really know how to work with it. Sound is becoming way more important. How to guide the attention of the viewer um, is it's changing, but it's only a few years uh, until we are going to have the devices uh, readily available to most of us to to be inside one of these environments. And that is we 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 have to do some more work to get this to get the language down and to uh, to make this. Uh, a nice and good experience for for the recipient, I think. Yeah, I, I think in terms of where to, I mean, all, always with 360 is where do you want the audiences or the individual uh, to place their attention? Yes. And one could do it with light. One could do it with movement, energy. Uh, sound is important. Uh, sound is super important. Sound, especially yes. if you if you can place it in the space, and that is coming more and more. That will be one of the very important cues there. Yeah, so, that's so, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you still only have two ears, but so it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can you can do a lot of interesting things there, and there's a ton of experimentation right now. Friend of mine, I've, I just. Just before we did this live stream, I did an interview with him for tips from the top floor, where uh, he he filmed hiking in the Himalayas with 360 and with regular rectangular formats, and he's editing that. And uh, the the problem right now is he's editing that basically for an audience watching it on rectangular devices because nine out of 10 people will watch that on YouTube without ever even having the idea that they can swipe around and see something else. So he has to, at, at this point, he has to edit that for uh, for a rectangular audience, for lack of a better word. And, um, and uh, that means that if you take that same material and try to watch it inside a VR headset, there are so many cuts that jerk you around that it's 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 not it's not a lot of fun to watch it in that. So if he had the time, he's spending like ten hours editing on one of these episodes. So if he had the time, he would be doing two completely separate versions of that for the different types of audiences. Also, isn't one of the major problem that I, I've experimented a bit with those 360s, um, and and one of the problems is the um, how do you make the the transition from one camera position to another uh, so that it becomes a fluid dynamic if rather you, than a cut. If you keyframe that, people will get motion sick. <laughs> Exactly there's, my point. There's, I, I, I there's still things to be solved. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's 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 actually interesting though that yeah, just as a, a takeaway from the whole show is that I uh, I wasn't I wasn't seeing much in terms of computational photography and the usage of computational photography. Um, so, yeah, that was something I'm cl clearly very interested in, um, as are we all, and. It's there's I, I I'm not sure why because there was plenty about using you know using phones um, uh, as a as a as a main camera um, but little about 
what it other other than them being small and easy to position and discreet little little about really how they might help you so there wasn't anybody saying this is how you do night shots because that you night night mode video on or, or or something like that there wasn't anything about um you know capturing um uh, bursts you know or, or or any of the other things that we come to to think about in in our phones and and our uh, our non dedicated camera devices um that would that was interesting to me because uh, and then I thought well possibly it's because a lot of the money behind this show comes from the manufacturers of traditional <laughs> cameras our listener uh, uh, our listener the frog says that there will be a talk tomorrow called through the night which I think covers some of that oh excellent excellent thank think thank you for pointing that out yeah um Uh, Dude, if you could seen it. if you could create your ideal trade show hmm. what would it be that's not what? a question we can answer here i guess <laughs> that's a, <laughs> well, that's a tiny question with fly. huge consequences yeah I can I, can, I can't tell you <laughs> what the whole asking. thing would look like. Yeah, I can't tell you what the whole thing would look like. I have to go back though and say that Chris and I had different opinions of the user interface for this show. I oh, thought it was I delightful, like it. delightfully clunky, but delightful. It was okay. So so here here uh, okay. Just just let me get rid of this here for a second. We had a um, yeah, we had a bit of a disagreement. I mean, it was nice that they had this like visual representation of a show floor, and you had different areas you could click on and so on. But um, the the just the, the fact that most of the links or a big chunk of the links led you outside of this experience, yeah, to, they did, the comp, yeah, yeah. the corporate pages of Canon and so on, without letting you know that this would take you outside of the conference. So you would end yeah, up being the same problem. being kicked so out. So sometimes they did, yeah. and sometimes they didn't, which was interesting. and there was no marker of that. That was um, the whole thing mm. was. For me, it was a bit of a frustrating experience to navigate. Having that said, I mean, yeah, it, there, there's, I think there's certainly ways to make this easier and simpler. Um, but the way it was, it was a bit disconnected. I mean, there was the analog stream, which was pre-recorded sessions, and I, it took me five minutes to find those videos on the website because they were like, yeah, that was hard. Actually, I thought things. that they made that harder than necessary. So yeah, it should have. I think it should have been much much easier. But then again, it's a free show, so who am I to complain about free stuff that I get? That is interesting. I was really referring to what the best. Um, subjects of uh, who would you invite to a trade show given that a, a normal trade show where you could walk around yeah. or or a virtual one but what would be the ideal one i mean you know obviously there would be new gear or old gear how to use it uh, there would be inspirational stuff there would be galleries there would be a section on corporate but how would that should a trade show have a theme each year that really drives the focus or should it be just so general you know if you have a template for this and it's something that you can easily create with a different set of content which i think is probably going to be possible then um why not have one of these every every other month with a new theme i mean this this, this could really yeah. be done now because people don't have to travel they just need to free up like half a day for a bunch of sessions and um do this in I, i'm thinking about the workshop business because um here in germany our happy shooting workshops they are yeah they they don't happen right now and uh we're looking at virtual ways to do them and uh, i got some in, some distinct feedback from some listeners saying that You know, we we can't we we have a family. We have lots of stuff. We are in front of screens all the time. We don't want to like block off half a day to do something. How about making this a instead of a like a weekend workshop thing? How about making this into a a, a group that meets up every few weeks and uh, we 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 discuss photos and we do assignments together? But it's like a short evening meeting for maybe an hour, and that's that happens every two or three weeks, something like that. Just, you mean like just Alcoholics change. Anonymous? <laughs> sort of, but but make it photo, photo, photographers anonymous. Um, but you know, you know, ch change the format in ways that the online world 
lends itself to as opposed to having this two days and everything is together which is nice because it gets attention but uh it's kind of tough to sit through like an entire two days of sessions you probably won't really do this whereas it, it at a trade show you would have done it, you know and it's been pretty intense today and it's disturbingly qu like what i do monday to friday as well <laughs> and, that, and that's a bit um, of a so problem with the online conferencing problem, yeah. world yes it, it is a bit of a problem but it, but it is also nice that i've been able to say okay here's a day i'm going to focus on this for a day and 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 get value out of it um, but you are doing uh, this from your home I, I there's your family yeah, around there's friends there's like lots of distractions well they were all out yeah. today mostly so it was <laughs> fine but like they uh it is it is it is an interesting one though so what i've experienced today is very much an attempt to to in some ways replicate what you would get at a normal trade show i mean there were uh, uh you know there were people online you know staff behind the ex exhibition booths who you could chat to and stuff like that um, and it did seem, it did seem perhaps that some opportunities were missed. It could have been more about, there could be maybe more of a theme. It could be more based around um, work, uh, you know, actually seeing work as opposed to you know, doing work. Um, and it could, uh, and maybe even more on education, although there was, there were, there were quite a few interesting and educational type things as well. Oh, I think I'm always interested, by the way, for on, on that point of education, I'm always interested in like a real, just tell me how you guys feel, like where there would be, say, five hour or half a day on printing technologies, mm -hmm. like just from soup to nuts, just everything you want to know about printing on the highest technical level, whether it's book printing all the way to cyanotypes to you know, making a daguerreotype, coding emulsions, using the latest Canons, using the latest Epsons, the new printers that are coming. Like, I think that is great. Uh, you know, like to actually dig down and use, that's what I meant by a focus theme. Mm. You know, uh, mm -hmm. one could be on lenses, glass, from old Russian glass, adapting that to the what's coming in terms of fluorite and you know what could it those things would really be inspiring and and also interesting but also commercial and commercially viable for the sponsors so i think making it too general um feels to me that it the attraction of this show felt more um with for starting photographers for people yeah. who are looking just to to what's interesting to how get a can taste I get of into everything it, pretty much be, yeah yeah it, it is a very consumer oriented show um apart from um, apart from that some of the equipment is, is pro equipment um a lot of the content in the show and it's it's always been like that uh, this particular show has always been quite consumer oriented um uh, but it's I, I don't think that it, i think it, it it has a larger addressable market if it if it pitches itself that way um perhaps and then maybe maybe the uh, the concept of i guess another name for what you've just described jeremiah is master classes um yeah and and to go th to have yeah, that kind of in-depth i yeah, i, I want to be useful I want to interject here because um, the, the master classes are really targeted towards the high level of things. But um, what I see as an opportunity with the themed ones that Jeremiah mentioned is to have something that has something for every level, like people who want to get started with, let's say, yeah. cyanotype, who people want to mm -hmm. get started with that, people who want to go uh, more advanced, people who want to go to the to the ma most masterful yeah. level. So have everything in there uh, so everyone can dive into a topic and it doesn't have to be a sign up I, it could be it could be a bit broader and say printing and that could cover much more and lots more things i think there are opportunities yeah, to change the general print, format right? of things yeah yeah um but what could, by the way could, one talk that i watched um that i found interesting and very very relevant to what we are going through right now was a journey through isolation with david yarrow um who's a photographer um, who I think does a lot of commercial photography. And he, um, I, I didn't know him before. Um, he has a very 
distinct, very high contrasty processed style, black and whites, um, which is for my taste almost a bit over the top but uh, again that's just a matter of taste and he he talked about uh, photo shoots different kinds of photo shoots and shot showed photos and it was an interview but it was very well edited like there were there were like there was camera switching there were he was showing what he was talking about which was very helpful and a lot about the shooting in the context of covid um where like how do you do the logistics to get somewhere um for example like one shoot in iceland he said it wasn't a problem to get to iceland because iceland's second biggest um biggest uh money maker is film the film industry so they kind of need that so they were um, relatively easy um, on getting into the country and working there of course you had to be tested and everything but then talked about the logistics team that helps getting these things done like in on some photo shoots there was like temper temperature testing five times a day um, got to be a bit resourceful uh, he talked about africa because he shot in the serengeti over the last four or five months and um he talked about uh like what that means because if you have the big stretches of the serengeti for yourself as a pro photo team um what does that mean because the, your strength in that moment is you're alone so you don't have any tourists walking into your shots but at the same time those um strengths become weaknesses because you have less eyes finding things because if if, if you've ever been on a safari you will know that you meet others that come at you and they stop and they say if you go half an hour this way you'll see this and this and that we just saw that there so there's a lot of communication going on around these things that did not happen so it was tougher to find the good spot so but that was really good great stories i mean shoot a shoot in texas where he says um everyone has a gun um they they sell guns next to toothpaste and at one point they had a rental car and they accidentally took the wrong car in front of a pub so they drove away with someone's car and he looked under the seat and there was a loaded gun under there so they brought the car back and just pretended nothing happened I had a very fun uh interview with <laughs> scary situations so that was uh, yeah again a journey yeah. through isolation david yarrow um he's british i think no he's australian i think Anyway, it was that was fun um, to watch and good information in there. Mm. So that was very well, very relevant. Yeah, it's been quite a day actually, hasn't any, it? It's any any other talks you know, that you've seen, Adrian, that you found worth mentioning? Well, um, uh, yeah, the, what, just just some of it. Some of it worked really well. I mean, the one that Rode Microphones did about. You know, or editing audio for video, and and it was really be, it it was the basics of uh, of EQ, the basics of compression and things like that. But it went into into it and explained the reasons why, and explained how all of these things worked. Um, I thought that was a really good one. If anybody's if anybody's uh, you know just bought their first little microphone to plug into their phone for shooting video and wants to get a little bit crisper sound out of it and things like that you know uh, it could that could be a really good video I'd recommend that one it was well put together uh, there are some others unfortunately where some of the some of the live camera switching didn't work quite so well where you could switch cameras and but then lost audio and stuff like that but still some some interesting stuff there um, and I think um, uh, I think just the, the one about solutions journalism, I'll, I'll mention briefly. Now, this is a chap um, called Doug or Dougal Shaw, I think. And he, this was another interview one. But he is a, uh, I suppose you'd call him a, a journalist and also perhaps a documentary filmmaker. Um, and he was talking about his workflow, but also his shooting equipment, which is uh, essentially a phone uh, and a microphone. Um, and he was talking about just just what it changes in the dynamics of speaking to people and interviewing people. It's not just about being you know um, agile and being able to go and do these things on your own. Um, although of course, yeah, that that is um, that does make things e slightly easier in these times. Um, it is also just about the connections that you make. Um, I think one of his messages was that if you have a phone, and this is a really tangible but really prosaic thing, if you have a phone, the distance you need to get to from somebody 
uh, to to do a sort of medium length shot that you might want for an interview, a filmed interview, is roughly the same distance as you would stand naturally just to talk to them and have a conversation. And so there's a really good dynamic there um, about you, you. It's it's not so much an us and them because you're not you know, 10 feet away, hiding behind a massive camera on a tripod. You're, you're actually at a, a normal conversation distance and you're carrying a very small piece of equipment and, uh, you know, you can make good eye contact, you can talk to each other. Um, he said it was a bit, he, he did have a little clip where he was trying to do the same thing after COVID had kicked in and, and, and his, in his microphone, instead of being mounted on the, on the little frame he was holding the phone in. Um, was now then on a, a, yeah, a four foot boom pole because he hadn't get too close, <laughs> um, and it was noticeable that that did change. You know, the, you know as, as an observer, that changed the dynamic of the interview that he was doing, um, and so that that was that was interesting. As I say, I still don't really have much of an idea what solutions journalism is, but but certainly, I think that in a lot of ways that is, if it's not the present of photography, it, it's the future of of photography you know especially the the ad hoc quick response journalistic type of content you know um, it's interesting interesting how the iphone uh in shooting videos uh is so relatively unthreatening to people mm -hmm. that both on sort of street photography interviews just generally because everyone has them so they don't see them as like oh this glaring eye looking at them they have to tighten up i mean there's a you know I've, I've worked on documentaries before and and the the trick with documentaries when you're having a lot of gear sometimes two cameras and you know you're you're invading somebody's life is th the rule of thumb is just you keep hanging around and you keep shooting and shooting and shooting because for the first it could be day two days three days People are just, they're on guard. They're, they're very measured in their responses. But after a while, it's just like, oh, I can't keep this up. And that's when you start to get gold. You saturate it, them, yeah. They, they just become, <laughs> it, yeah, you just become part of their regular world. And they just let it, you know, let it go. And I say this when I've been on camera, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. With an iPhone, that happens just like that a lot quicker because yeah it, it's it's a, just a familiar piece of technology that everyone understands likes embraces and go of course you have an iphone of course you want to take a picture of me <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and i think you get a lot of different kinds of things and i it's, think that that is a very exciting I, I think it is i think it's it is different um and uh, and as the technology in these phones gets better, the the compromises you have to make, you know, the quality versus connection, perhaps being a historical compromise you have to make, uh, that that that's less of an issue. Um, and it, or th one last thing, though, on the technology front, it, it was interesting to note that everybody that had a phone had an iPhone. <laughs> Nobody had any phones that were not iPhones. So, I mean, you hit see now. I think Sony have released a new phone recently that that shoots incredibly detailed video, and and Sony know how to make sensors and cameras, don't they? Uh, but nobody nobody had anything but an iPhone. Um, so, uh, I don't know if the, what what that says uh, about the future of photography, but uh, it it was just an observation I made. <laughs> well, so. I would say we'll wrap this up here. It's a, uh, yeah, it's an it's an interesting. I, I like this discussion because it went into what they said, but also what the whole show was like and what might be different. I think that's one of our strengths to to theorize about how to do these things differently. So um, thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Jeremiah, for being here and doing this little live stream. Um, we are going to release this as a regular episode. So whoever listens to this, you can also go watch it. Uh, it's going to be up on YouTube. And um, with that, uh, I think next episode will be a regular episode again. Um, we will put some of the titles of these uh, sessions in the show notes. So you can go look them up on their website and maybe rewatch them. And uh, with that, I'd say okay. um, bye-bye. Thanks for your time. Have a good one. We'll see you soon. <laughs> bye. See you Take soon. care, guys. Bye-bye.